Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Canaan STL Podcast, brought to you by Canaan Baptist Church, where we exist to connect you to what matters most, to God, to people, and to purpose. Hey, this is Pastor Daniel. So glad you're with us today, and I'm joined here by Pastor Martin Winslow. Hey, everybody. All right. And today we begin a new, really, we've never really done a series of podcasts, Mm -hmm. have we? Uh, I don't think we have. I don't think we have either. No. So this is going to be a series, uh, and we're, we're not exactly sure how many how many installments are going to be in this yeah. series. We're just going to go till we get it done. Yep. But this is on eschatology. Do you, do you think we should do it until Jesus comes back? Hey, you know what? That'd be great with me, uh, unless that's like another 2,000 years. Right, right. right. You know? One of us dies. Yep. Anyway, so... What we're going to be doing here is we're going to be going through the various views of, of eschatology. But let's just start with that. What is eschatology? Yeah, so eschatology comes from two Greek words, um, but uh, the main Greek word there is eschaton, which means last things. And so eschatology is the study of last things. Yeah, and there you go. Any theology book you pick up or if you go to a seminary, but basically if you pick up any theology book, one of the... One of the headings is going to be on the study of last things. Yep, that's right. So, that's right. And everybody believes the same thing, right, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why we're doing this podcast, yeah. right? Because right. there's such uniformity. So easy. We're yeah. being sarcastic. <laughs> um, so, but I do, on that note, I do want to start off with kind of the tone with which we're going to handle this, not only here at the podcast, but coming up this fall on Sunday nights, we're going to be dealing with a lot of these same things and having panel discussions. Um, you know, but the, the tone of all this is going to be this, is that the Bible is very clear on many matters, right? It's very clear on the gospel. It's very clear on who God is. It's very clear on the person of Jesus Christ. And where there's clarity, we must have you know, a complete and total agreement. Yeah, because the clear things are what then formula, what we call are essential beliefs. And in our essential beliefs, we must have unity. And these are those beliefs, these doctrines that are directly tied to the gospel, like the inerrancy of Scripture, mm-hmm. the, the the triune God. You know that we are that God is holy and just, and we are sinners, totally depraved and separated from God. All of these great truths, you know, are non negotiable, mm-hmm. and we will not disagree on those. But then there's a lot of areas the Bible is just not as clear on, and these begin to populate this concept called we call our non essential beliefs. Right, that's where we can we can study the Word and we can come to dif- differences of views, but still be unified in the mission, the purpose of God, and even within our church family. You know, and some of these non-essentials could be, you know, what do you believe about, you know, speaking in tongues? Or what do you believe about end times? We're going to get into that. Or, you know, what do you believe about um, things like, you know, alcohol or whatever? You know, those are, there can be differences on those. I mean, you may be in the camp where you believe it's a sin to have a drink. You may be in the camp where, you know, if it, if you have a sip of wine, that, that's okay. As long as you don't cause your brother to stumble, we can defer on that and still be unified in our church family. So as we go forward here in talking about eschatology, we've got to understand that there's a lot of different views held by very brilliant and very godly people. And on these matters, this is sometimes not quite as clear. It's harder to put it all together. And so there's got to be a lot of grace, got to be be a lot of love, and just a lot of understanding that, you know, we're going to, we might see a few things differently, uh, but that's okay. We all agree on the big matter, which is the clear, that is Jesus is returning. Right. And so there's, there are some aspects of eschatology that are clear and on that we have to agree, but the timing or the, the sequence of events and yeah. these sort of matters, that's where there can be differing views, but that's, that's okay. So having said all that, what we're going to do today is we're just going to briefly give a a 35,000, maybe even higher than that view of each of the four major approaches to end times, to eschatology. All right. So Martin, what are those four big views? Yeah. So the four views are, um, and like you said, I think it's important that we, we recognize, uh, now some people would say that there's three views, but we'll, we'll talk about that too and why they delineate and, um, and, and talk about four, but, Um, it's important for us to recognize that this is like a non-essential. In fact, I'm sitting across from Daniel, and I would say Daniel and I probably agree on 99.9% of theology, but this is actually an area where we we actually hold a a different viewpoint from one another. Yeah, it's that 0.1% difference. Right, it's it's just there, and and that's okay. In fact, in my walk, I started out as premillennial, 
dispensationalist, and that's where there's a difference in three views or four. There's also a historic premillennialism, but there's just one view of premillennialism in general there. But I started out as dispensationalist, premillennial. Uh, later, for 16 years of my life, I, I lean more towards the amillennial view. And then um, just recently, really in the last year, um, I kind of lean now towards the, the post mill position. And so if you're looking for somebody to follow when it comes to end times, I'm not the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over the map. But just to kind of go over those four views real quick, the, the first view is premillennial. And basically, when we use the word millennial, that – that refers to a Bible passage, um, Revelation chapter 20. Yeah. Why don't you just read it? Let's yeah, just read it. sure. Yeah, so this is a, the, the, the millennium, right, is the key word in all of these views uh, because these views had to do, when does, when does Christ return in relationship with this millennium? Of course, a millennium, in a literal sense, is a thousand-year period. So um, this is only mentioned, really, mm-hmm. in the book of Revelation. Yeah. No other place in all of Scripture is this word millennium right. even used, right? So right. It's, it's just really interesting. That has become the measuring rod, if you will, yep, of it. all eschatological positions, yeah. right? But anyway, read yeah. what uh, what sure. the, the Apostle John is seeing in his vision as he records in Revelation. Yeah, so this comes out of Revelation 20. Again, like Daniel said, this is the only place where the millennium is mentioned. It's kind of sad that all the views are summed up around one chapter, but... Anyway, it says here, beginning with verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended." Okay, so if I just stop there, that's kind of like stopping in the middle of verse three. Now, there's a lot more that we'll unpack probably later as the, mm-hmm. you know, as the series goes on. But basically, those two places where the millennium is mentioned, um, you know, what does this mean that Satan is bound? I mean, that's the big question. Is this a future event? And mm-hmm. that's what premillennial position holds. Yes, is that basically um, that Christ. Uh, that there's a future millennial period where Satan is bound in a real way. Yes. And uh, during that thousand years, then, Christ will return physically to re- rule and reign on earth, typically people believe from Jerusalem. Yes. The Jewish nation may p- play a part in that, a special part in that, um, and we'll unpack that later, but it, it refers to the thousand years being in the future. Okay, so that's the first main view. And out of premillennialism, there's two views, historic premillennialism, which we'll get into later, or dispensational premillennialism. Yes, that's right. So it's a future event. And so so the major major difference between dispensational premillennialism and historical premillennialism is the timing of this event called the rapture. Right. You know, where the rapture is, um, you know, Matthew 24 kind of reads like rapture type language where the angels gather together the elect. Gather together the the church, the believers, right? At gathering, the word rapture comes from Latin, which means to be caught up together. Right, and so that's the the phraseology that's used. And so it is the dispensational premillennial view has the rapture is really the next event that happens. Right, you know that the church is raptured before this this seven year period called the tribulation takes place. Yeah, historical premillennialism sees the rapture kind of occurring simultaneously with the return of Christ. Right, right. not not as two separate events. And it would happen after the tribulation. Right, so right. that that is a, a key distinction. And yep. we'll get into what dispensation even means and all sure. that later. Sure. But uh, those are the two different views within premillennialism. Right. So we, we've made those two different views. Dispensational right. premillennialism is a view. Historical premillennialism is a view. Right. And then you have the um, amillennialism and postmillennialism. Right. So it, go ahead and explain those yeah. briefly. But as it relates to the millennium itself, the premillennial position says the millennium has not happened yet. That's Where correct. It's a future event. And that Christ will return before, before the, millennium. the millennium. There yes. you go. Now, the other two views, the, the, the next view I'll talk about for just a second here is postmillennialism. And post-millennial, postmillennials believe that um, what's going to happen is that um, we're basically – um, things are going to get 
better. As we look to the future, the nations will be evangelized, the gospel will be affected, effective, and what we'll see is that the nations will be drawn to the gospel. Every tribe, tongue, nation, and people um, will come to Christ. We'll have like this golden age, basically, that we're ushering into, this, this fruitful age where People are believing around the world. And so they point to passages like Matthew 24, 14 that says, you know, this gospel will go to all the nations and then the end will come. Um, They look at passages like in Revelation that says every tribe, tongue, nation, and people believe. And so they believe things are actually going to get better on earth and Christ returns after that millennium. Okay? Now, whether or not the millennium is exactly a thousand years, post post millennials will be like, eh, that doesn't really matter. It just it marks a period of time, so it doesn't have to be a literal millennium. Okay, but they look at the future as things getting better. The amillennial view looks at things like the church age. They 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 kind of look at things as a, like right now is a realized millennium. In other words, since the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, we've been in this time of a millennium. And what will happen is that the world will actually not become a better place. The gospel will conquer, and the gospel is conquering. They believe that. But they also believe that before Christ's return, things will get worse. Okay? So that's the big difference between post and ah. Post sees the, the world being evangelized and getting better before the return of Christ. Ah, millennial see things as getting worse before the return of Christ. Ah, millennial, though... Um, The A in front of it is called an alpha privative, which means that it's a negation. So they don't believe – it's not true that they don't believe in a millennium. They just don't believe that the millennium is actually literal. So it's just a a period of time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So pre-mill, we say that Jesus uh, would come back before this golden age, this millennium that he's going to set up on earth. Post-mill means that Basically, that we may be in the millennium right now, and things are getting better as the world is becoming evangelized. Amil believes not in a literal millennium, but also believes that things will get worse before the return of Christ, if we're to nutshell it. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Good. So so let's just kind of ask a few questions mm-hmm. and see how each one of the major four groups answers that question. So mm-hmm. the question would be, so, so what does each of you believe? Does Jesus return physically? Yeah, all all of the views actually hold that Jesus will return yes. physically, yep. that he had a physical resurrection, and that body's coming and back. And that is clear. Yeah. That is so clear in Scripture. Yeah. So all unanimously agree mm-hmm. on that fact. Uh, you already mentioned kind of, you know, when will, when will Jesus return? You know, dispensational pre-mill says he's going to return before a seven-year tribulation, right. before the millennium. Historical pre-mill is going to, he's going to come out. After the tribulation, but before the millennium, right. um, amillennialism says any time the, right. the, the detail is not in a the, the time frame is not important, mm-hmm. right? This this thousand year is very loose, and then post millennialism says it'll be after this millennial age, right. which may or may not be a literal one thousand years, right. right? And then, um, and all that just real quick, all that is built on their understanding of uh, Satan um, being bound, yeah. Right. What, what does that mean? Right. Yeah. So pre-mill would say Satan is not bound. Correct. Right. Both views of the pre-mill position. The amill would say yes. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus bound Satan, and post-mill would see that the same way that mm-hmm. he was bound by the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. Well, that's going to be a so. that's going to be an interesting conversation yeah. to get the different views. What is what does it mean for Satan to be bound? Right. 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 Um. So also the question: Will there be a great tribulation? Yeah. Right. Obviously, the both of the premillennial views mm-hmm. say yes. There's mm-hmm. going to be a seven year tribulation period. Mm-hmm. Um, the Amil and the postmill have a little bit different answers for those. Yeah. So, what would the Amil um, say? Yeah. So the Amil position says the tribulation occurs anytime Christians are persecuted or wars and disasters occur. So basically, during the church age, there's always been persecution. There's always been tribulation. Yeah. Now we're saved from the wrath of God, but Jesus says in this world you will have tribulation. So Amil kind of generalized that through the church age. You know, uh, two days ago we we heard from uh, Basaru Ba that one of his friends that was in Mauritania as a missionary had been arrested. They'd been threatening to kill him and for his faith, 
right? And yep. so persecution, those kind of things Absolutely. are just with us, right? Yep. Um, now, Post Mill believed that the tribulation is either the first century Jewish Roman war or the ongoing conflict between good and evil. Now, prior to the millennium. So this, this is where things can kind of get a little hairy, and we'll talk about that later. So basically, the post mill position is cut in two different parts here. Um, I lean towards basically, you know, when you look at Matthew twenty four or Luke twenty one, you see the all of that discourse of Jesus, which is the last full sermon that he gives, is that he's talking a lot about the end of the age, the Jewish age, with the fall of the of the Jerusalem Temple in seventy A.D. when Vespasian sent his son Titus in to conquer it. Um, and so we'll get into the details of this later, but they see that uh, basically 70 AD is a huge, huge date uh, for um, the post mill position. We'll get into the reasons why later. Also, you know, looking at these four different views, um, the question a lot of Christians ask do, do Christians go through the tribulation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the. You know, the only the pre mill view holds to a literal seven year tribulation. Right. So obviously, the a mill and post mill say yes, mm-hmm. we go through tribulation because mm-hmm. they, in their construct, they don't really have a the seven year tribulation. Mm-hmm. So the pre mill does, and dispensational pre millennialism would say the Christians do not go through the tribulation right. because they see the tribulation as the pouring out of God's wrath on the mm-hmm. earth, and God would not pour out His wrath on His own people. Right, and we would all agree with that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, pre mill, the historical historical premillennialism says Christians go, do go through the tribulation, but that that tribulation's not God pouring out His wrath. Right. That is the wrath of Antichrist and Satan against the church. It's kind of mm-hmm. that God would then allow for the purging, cleansing of the church before He raptures His bride perfectly and blameless and whole. Right. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. And again, we'll get into all this as we go through each view in depth. Um. Another question comes up within times is well, who or what is Israel and what is Israel's yeah. role? Mm-hmm. You know, why don't you why don't you address that from each one of the uh, views? Yeah, so with the dispensational um, view of premillennialism, um, it you know, if you were to ask the question, is the modern state of Israel relevant uh, to the prophecies in Revelation? The answer to that would be. Yes. In fact, dispensationalists hold a strong belief that there's a separation between the church, the bride of Christ, and ethnic Israel, okay? And that God has plans for each separately. Um, dispensationalists have held that. That's that's one of the things I would say that makes them very um, different from the other views, okay? Yeah. Within the other views, uh, historic premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism, those views more hold to like what might be termed covenant theology, that, that the covenant that was made with Israel is now fulfilled in the church. Yeah. So when Jesus says, this is a new covenant in my blood, take this and drink this and eat this. This is, this is like the fulfillment of all those promises that were made to Israel is now the bride of Christ. When Paul talks in Romans 15, he quotes from all sections of the Hebrew Old Testament, and he says, the nations that have now come in were always a part of God's plan. And now that there's been Gentile inclusion, this was, this was God's plan from the beginning, and that's a realized Israel. Uh, in fact, they may say, you know, like Romans 2 talks about, who is a Jew? A Jew is one who's circumcised in the heart. And so they don't make the big distinction between ethnic Israel and, and the church being called Israel. Anybody who's a true believer in the gospel and has been changed in their heart is a Jew, a spiritual Jew. Does that make sense? And so, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's the view of these other, um, and you may add to that because I know you're historical pre. Let me let me be fair. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so yeah, that's good. So we'll have the Israel discussion because, you know, there are some parts in Romans where Paul seems to talk out of both sides of his mouth, so to speak. You yeah. Know, he talks about how... You know, in Romans eleven, how for the for the gospel's sake we are enemies, but for the sake of election we are you know together. So in there, yeah. the they is the Gentile believers and the Jewish people by blood. So that yeah. you know, and, it, it kind of talks out of both sides, and it's it's super interesting. Yeah. Um, so l- lastly, uh, as we get ready to wrap up this first session, um, what when was these views? When when would they become like recognized theological views? Mm-hmm. 
and what was their kind of popularity, shelf life? You know, there's been some ebb and flow in these different views. You know, like, for example, the newest one definitely is dispensational premillennialism. Right. You know, that was – that view was kind of formalized and, and – and, well, I think formally, it was just kind of created, if you yeah. will, by a guy named Darby yep. uh, in the early 1800s. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a, a member of uh, a Plymouth Brethren church. And so he kind of formulated this dispensationalism, which included the view of end times. And so it really, once he did that, it really grew in popularity yeah. mid to late 1800s mm-hmm. and um, really has been very popular up until the last 20, 25 years. It's yeah. begun to decrease mm-hmm. in popularity. So let's talk about that because you mentioned it. You, originally, you were mm-hmm. dispensational pre mill as was right. I. That's, right. that's what I was taught. In fact, that's all I was taught mm-hmm. growing up in a Southern Baptist church uh, for about 100 years. That's all the yeah. so right. Baptist church is taught. Right. 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 So what, what's happened? Why, why has that view, why did it kind of rise in popularity? And now we're seeing it pretty sharply decline. I mean, younger generations, uh, like in seminary right now, it's, it's taught, but very few professors hold to it these days. Right. Um, very few pastors coming out uh, today that are probably 50 years old and younger, very few hold to it. Why would that be? What do you think? What yeah. do you think the reason for that is? So, so I think there's multiple reasons, but but I would point I would point to this as probably the big reason. So, when you look at American history, for instance, British and American history, from you know you go from the 1700s forward, um, you've got you know things that would happen later, like the Industrial Revolution and this growth in America and this safety in America, and I I think. That probably what began to happen is there was this feeling that um, you know we didn't go through hard times and difficulties and and so with this preaching of this theology that God would never allow His church to go through these bad things it became easier and easier to believe but what began to happen with the missionary movement. in in the late 1700s and 1800s as well, but it was a slower, is now we live in a global society, and I think it's lost its luster because we've just realized in the last 50 to 100 years how persecuted the church is globally. And that, you know, this is not just, uh, you know... um, you know, this freedom we have in America, we don't have that in other places in the world. You know, there's not democracies and mm-hmm. those things like that that thrive. And so the church goes through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. In fact, I remember reading years ago um, a missionary talking about, uh, hey, listen, when you guys come and you bring missionaries to China, stop telling them that God's going to rapture his church out before persecution because mm-hmm. many of these people have lost their families. Yeah. And so don't bring that theology, just bring the gospel. Stay mm-hmm. away from the end times, you know, question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think we've just had a realization that this rapture idea before there's any pain or suffering is really just kind of a modern concept of the last 150 years, like you said, yeah. from John Nelson Darby. Yeah. I think another issue, especially in Southern Baptist life, because I mean, I'm, like, again, like you, I grew up just being taught dispensational premillennialism. Um, but, you know, in, in the 70s and ni- in the 1970s, 1980s, even some into the 1990s was the whole battle for the Bible yeah. in SBC life. And, you know, thankfully, praise God, we were one of the very few groups that came down that we're going to we're going to hold to the Bible. The Bible is the inerrant word of God. Mm. Well, I think what that did is that generated um, a new generation yeah. where we go to the Bible for everything, mm-hmm. you know, and for for me, I mean. Even though everything you said totally makes sense for me, my yeah. why I left the dispensational premillennial view was simply because I just don't see it in Scripture. Yeah, and you know, there's been several things in SBC life that have uh, kind of matriculated from. I think there's a whole new generation that is completely trusting the Bible, not simply what we were taught as kids. Right. 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 You know, you have in times you have the issue of you know. Election predestination. We've seen a yep. rise in the number of reformed um, yep. Southern Baptists, especially the younger people, because mm-hmm. we're just it's just election language. It's just all over the Bible. Right. Also, um, elders and polity that's yep. having more of a plurality of elders. Why? Because that is so saturated in yep. the Bible. So I think there's some key mm-hmm. you know, issues in SBC life that have kind of changed the last 25, 30 years yeah. for good reason. Because we have said we we have put our anchor on. 
the word of God, yeah. which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I think I think this is one of those many issues um, where there's there's been a, a kind of a departure from dispensational premillennialism, mm-hmm. uh, just because it's based on a system of theology, not necessarily scripture and verse. Yeah. Don't you feel like, too, like a lot of crosstalk now, like denominationally, has been helpful? Like, I remember the first time I heard anything other than premillennial dispensationalism was actually a series I listened to by D. James Kennedy. Hmm. He's Presbyterian, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and then I started listening to Sproul, and it was R. like, Sproul. hey, maybe yeah. these guys over here have something. Yeah. And they look over here and say, well, maybe these Baptists over yeah. here have something, yeah. you know? Yeah. Now, I say... I, I, I just don't see dispensational pre meal, but yeah. there are many that do. Sure. So let's just, sure. let's end up on on well. So let's well we talked about that. What about historical pre meal? When when did it start? It's actually the oldest yeah. view. Yeah. So it's called historical pre meal because really it it its founding is with the church fathers. Yeah. So you've got Irenaeus, who was an early church father, Papias. A lot of the early church fathers would talk about um, you know a future millennium that they yep. believe where Christ was going to come back and set up his kingdom here on earth and rule from Jerusalem. And so it's called historic premillennialism because again, it's, it's rooted in history. It's, yep. it's a really strong position when you look at the early church. Yep. That's right. And then, you know, the amill and postmill, amillennialism, uh, you really don't see a lot of it popularized until right around the ta- fall of the, of the Western Roman empire around yeah. 400, 500 AD. That's going to, it kind of became more of a popularized because it saw the world kind of gradually get worse and worse right. and worse until right. the coming of Christ. Um, but it continues to be a popular view mm-hmm. today. You know, I know, um, you know, well, let's go back. Histor- I mean, uh, yeah, dispensational premium. Who are some famous teachers of the word today that hold to that view? Yeah, so some famous people would be like in history, like uh, the Schofield Bible, yep. you know. Our, yep. Um, yep, Schofield, James Ryrie. Charles, yep, yep, yep. James Ryrie, Charles Ryrie. You've also Charles got, Ryrie, yeah. Yep, you've got um, – so John MacArthur, David Jeremiah, Greg Laurie. Um, it's a pretty popular view, yeah. Yeah, and especially among the older generations, yep. you know, because that's what's been yep. taught for right. eons, you know, right. uh, in our – the recent history. Mm-hmm. What about historical premillennialism? There's some famous preachers that hold to that view, such as Charles Spurgeon, um, John Gill, who's a lot of the, a lot of the mm. Puritan guys um, were were that. Um, John Piper, Al Mohler, Francis Schaeffer are all proponents of at some yeah. point to historical premillennialism. It's hard to believe all those guys are wrong. Oh, <laughs> listen at you. Oh, yeah, this is going to be fun. All right, here we go. Uh, what about amillennialism? Who are some famous proponents of amillennialism? R.C. Sproul would be a famous one. Yep. D. James Kennedy. Yeah, a lot of your um, Presbyterians yep, are Yeah, a lot are of Presbyterians are mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And what about post-millennials? Jonathan Edwards is a good one. Yep. You know? Yep, Jonathan um, Edwards. A famous guy today is Doug Wilson. Doug Wilson. Yeah, yep. he's, he's making waves with post-millennialism. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. So post-millennialism, um, it, it's really not been too popular as yep. a whole, mm-hmm. actually, until – well, it kind of hit a little steam before World War I. Yep. And um, – but then when the World War I happened, followed by the Great Depression, followed by World War II, people were like, wait, things are not getting better. Right. And so there was almost almost a complete abandonment yeah. of postmillennialism. But it is seeing a stark yeah. rise right now. Yeah. You know, in fact, some people have said that even you know, we mentioned R.C. Sproul for yeah. um millennialism, but um I think he actually came out right toward the end and said he's actually post millennialist. Ah, I knew I love that guy. Uh, yeah. Um, now that's that's hearsay. I don't yeah. have that in any kind of document. Right before his last breath, right? I don't know about right. that. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, Vody Bauckham has shifted from amillennial to post millennialism. I did not know that. Yep. Um, but yeah, Doug. You know, you mentioned Doug. Doug White. He's the Doug, Doug White? Wilson. Doug, Doug Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. There's, a, there's another White. Who, okay. Yeah. Um, James R. White. James R. Yeah, White. The apologist. Yeah. So, but it's just post millennialism seeing a stark rise, especially among the younger generations. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the cool things about I think post mill guys is they believe the kingdoms come right. It came with the inauguration of Christ's ministry when when he said the kingdom of God is at hand in Mark. But here's what their their view is. They want to take the invisible kingdom, right, that's happened in our hearts as Christians and make it a visible kingdom. And so these guys are all about taking dominion in areas of politics and, and 
education and all these areas where they, they want to be invited to tables of influence to make the world a better place and to give Christian culture because the gospel's changing us. And I, I really admire that in the post mill position. Yep. That's good. So we have a lot to talk about. So stay tuned for future sessions as we continue to talk about eschatology on the Canaan STL podcast. So we'll talk to you next time.